Well, I want to welcome you all today. My name is Tyler. I'm the campus pastor at our Stone County campus. So honored to be hanging out with you all today as we continue in our series called The Wonder Switch. And this series is all about discovering the wonder of God. Or for some of us, it's about rediscovering the wonder of God. Today's message is a church. Uh, is a church. Today's message is a message for those of us who are churched and for those of us who are unchurched. For those of us who have a relationship with Jesus and for those who have not yet started a relationship with God and are wondering, is there something to faith? And today we're going to talk specifically about finding wonder in our refuge. But before we dive into all that, I want to take a few moments to let you know a little bit about myself, my family, and what's happening at our Stone County campus down in the big city of Wiggins. And shout out to the fam in Wiggins. If y'all would make some noise right now, I would greatly appreciate that. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So uh, let's go all the way back to the year 2000. My mom remarried an amazing guy named Fred, and he was from Wiggins. And I remember praying specifically, God, never let me move to Wiggins. And then in the year 2000, that's where we moved to. And in the fourth grade, I met this really pretty girl named Nancy. And in fourth grade terminology, we were talking. That's what we said. That was, that was going out. We're talking. But we never talked because that was too awkward. We would just see each other in the hallway and, what up? But we wouldn't say anything. And then a couple weeks after our relationship begun, she broke up with me on the playground. Not through words, but through a letter from some of her bozo friends. And then in the 11th grade, so let's fast forward to the 11th grade, we started going out again. And uh, this time it was a little more serious. And we ended up getting engaged in college and got married shortly after that. Shortly after college, not the engagement. It, it was a long engagement. I had, to, I had to propose early to make sure she wouldn't leave me. That was part, of the, was part of the strategy there. Anyway, we get married, and we begin talking about what we wanted for our lives and our career and our church and all of those type of things. And it was in that year, 2015, where we visited the Lincoln Road campus. And we were blown away by a movement that was taking place just 35 minutes from my house, and I had never heard of Venture. I was like, what's a Venture? But that's a weird name for a church. Anyway, we came up here and loved it. We were in a series called Gray Matter. Pastor Jeff was speaking on how we have to decide what we are going to do, what we're going to believe, how we're going to go. 2015, I still remember it. Matt Smith was leading worship. He was wearing these jeans that were skinny and way up here, and I was like, what is going on? But I remember being blown away by the whole experience. Shortly after that, Nancy and I joined the Venture family. I came on lead team, which is an apprenticeship. And to skip a whole lot of details, in 2017, we had the amazing privilege of launching our Stone County campus. And to see what God is doing there and doing at all of our campuses has been so amazing. I couldn't imagine doing anything else. I, I can't even believe we get to do what we get to do. To see a movement of God take place like this in South Mississippi, it is unbelievable. Last year, Nancy and I welcomed our first child into the world, and his name is Jordan. We call him Baby J. I want you guys to see a picture of Baby J. Absolutely love this kid. And I want to tell you a story about him, what happened at the house a couple weeks ago. And this story is going to segue us into the topic of God being our refuge. So it was about four, maybe five weeks ago. Uh, I got to the house at about 5.30. That's typical rhythm for us. And every night at 6.30, on the dot, no matter what, we're giving Jordan a bath. Because at 7, is bedtime. It works like clockwork. Every night, don't matter if it's the weekend, 6.30 is bedtime. 7 o'clock is bedtime. So it's about 6, a few minutes after 6, me and Jordan are rolling around and playing. And he's got this little blanket that he just buries his face in and growls at it. And we say, oh, soft banky. Can't believe I just said that through a microphone. I'm a, I'm a grown man saying soft banky with my baby. And then we were playing on the basketball goal, got him a little goal, and he'll get the ball up and dunk it, and he'll go, ah. Like, that's what I'm talking about. So anyway, we're playing with Jordan that night, rolling around, and it's about 6.15, and the kid smells terrible. He made a dirty diaper, and I'm like, Jordan, I've told you this already, bro. We don't do that when daddy's around. 
We reserved that for mommy time. That's mommy time right there. 6.20. I'm like, I can't take it no more. The kid smells awful. But it's 10 minutes before bath time, y'all. 10 minutes. Diapers are expensive. I ain't trying to change this kid's diaper. 10 minutes. But I couldn't take it. I was like, all right, Tyler, just be a, be a man. Change your kid's diaper. So we go into his room. I, I take him to the changing table. I lay him on the changing table 10 minutes before bath time. And I go to get a couple wipes. And as I'm, I'm reaching for the third wipe, because I'm not sure what's on the other side of that diaper. So I'm like, this may be a three or four wipe kind of day. So I'm reaching for the last one, and it's stuck. And so I'm jerking on it. And as all of that's happening, I just hear it. And I turn around, and Jordan had fallen face first from about this high and landed straight on his face. And he had the saddest little squeal. And his mama had the scariest squeal from the kitchen. And I was terrified. So I picked Jordan up. I was nervous to see him because of how he looked. And I was nervous for myself because what was about to happen to me. And I pick him up. And I don't want to go into all the details because you'll call DHS on me. And I'll be an unfit dad and all those kind of things. But it my baby had blood in places that we've never seen him have blood before. And it was terrifying. So we're both just, oh, my goodness, what do we do? I was like, I don't know. Just jump in the car and let's go somewhere. Where are we going? I don't know. I'll call the doctor on the way. So we hop in the car. I'm not going to tell you all the laws that we broke in the car, but there were multiple ones for that. I'm very sorry. Lord, forgive me. I call our doctor on the way, Dr. Bobby. He's incredible. I say, yo, Doc, um, Nancy... Nancy dropped Jordan off the changing table. What do we do? And he said, just come over to the house. I was like, all right, we're headed that way. And as we're driving to Dr. Bobby's house, Jordan keeps like, he's got this little, like, like you see stars. And I, I'm saying, if this kid passes out, like I'm done. I don't know. I am, I am panicking. Nancy's panicking. We get to the doctor's house. We walk inside and Bobby and Deshay, they see the sheer panic on our face. And they see the tears rolling down Nancy's eyes because I'm a grown man. I don't cry no matter what. <laughs> and Bobby takes Jordan and he starts looking at him. And basically, he tells us he's going to be okay. There's no brain damage. Do better next time, Dad. And it was in that moment where we were just able to, we were able to breathe and relax. We knew everything was okay. In a very real sense that night, Dr. Bobby and his expertise in his house and his family, they were our refuge. Because when we were there, we knew that we were okay. The danger that we were in, we knew we were okay. And scripture tells us in Psalms 46.1 that the Lord is your refuge and strength. He is your ever-present help in times of, of troubles. Almost says struggles, struggles and troubles. He is our ever present help. And so today, I want to spend a few minutes talking about the fact that God is our refuge. And we're going to be in Psalm 77 if you have your Bibles. If not, you'll see it on the screens. But we're looking at a guy named Asaph. Asaph is the writer of this psalm. And I want us to look at Asaph because this was a guy who was famous for helping people discover the wonder of God. He was the choir director. For all of Israel, he made his living leading people to discover the wonder. But we find him in a situation where he is no longer l telling people about wonder. He is trying to rediscover the wonder. It's almost as if he went through this past year with all of us. And if we're honest, this past year hasn't been great. And I didn't realize it until January when we were doing the Reset series that somewhere along the way of the social distancing and staying away and this, that, and the other and being so fixated on social media and the news, by the way, is killing our society. I did not even realize that I had lost my wonder. And I look up and I'm saying, how did I get here? 
And if we're honest with ourselves, there's a lot of us. We're just saying, God, please show us the wonder. I want to see you more than I do now. So if you have your Bible, Psalm 77. Asaph says this in verse 1, and I'm hoping that this chapter will help us discover or rediscover part of the wonder of God. He says, I cried out to God for help. I cried out to God to hear me. When I was in distress, I sought the Lord, and at night I stretched out untiring hands, and I would not be comforted. In other words, Asaph is saying, God, I came to you, I cried out to you, I reached my hands out for you, and you didn't comfort me. You see, Asaph knew where to go. He knew that God was his refuge. But as he goes to his refuge, he doesn't find any relief. And as he goes to the one who brings comfort, one of the Hebrew words for Nehemiah, I mean, for God is Nehemiah, which means the God of my comfort. And as he goes to the God of his comfort, what does he not receive? Comfort. And so he's sitting there trying to figure out what to do next. Have you ever been there, honestly, when you open your Bible and you read it and there's no wonder? And you're just like, well, maybe tomorrow. And then you come back and you open your Bible and you read it. There's no wonder. You pray and it's like, what's the point? Have you ever been to church? seeking refuge, seeking hope, and just feel hopeless. That's where Asaph is. Oftentimes, that's where I find myself. And I want to ask this question, and let me preface by saying this is not to question God's integrity or to question God's holiness or his faithfulness, because eventually we believe we serve a holy God, the one true God. So this is more of a question about us. It's a personal question dealing with what we do in difficult circumstances. The question is, what do you do when God is not good enough? What do you do? Because in church we have these sayings like, God is good all the time. All the time, God is good. But what do you do when he's not? What do you do when you go to your refuge but find no relief? Where do you go then? What do we turn to then? So that's where Asaph is. And, and he's, he's about to be very transparent with how he discovers the wonder. This is what he says in verse 3. He says, I remembered you, God, and I groaned. I meditated and my heart grew faint. You kept my eyes from closing. And I was too troubled to speak. We're going to stop right there before we get to verse 5. He says, God, as I remembered you, the more I thought about your goodness and how good you've been to me, the worse it got. Because I know that you could, if you would, but for whatever reason you won't. And why will you not? Why will you not show yourself to me? Why will you not bring me comfort? Why will you not bring me relief? And he says, as I thought about how good I know you were, It just frustrates me all the more because you're not good to me now. And he says, I reached out to you. There was no comfort. He says, you are the one that kept my eyes from closing. In other words, he's saying, I couldn't even sleep. At night, I couldn't sleep. Have you ever been there before? Going through so much stress, trauma, worrying, can't sleep. You just lay awake, your mind's racing. That's where he is. And he said, you kept my mouth from speaking. Just think about this. Asaph, he's the choir director. He makes a living leading people in worship. Just imagine if Jeff, don't imagine him singing because he's rapped some for us. And we don't want to go back to that one. So not the singing part, but just imagine him getting up here ready to deliver a message. And he stands here. He 
Couldn't even speak. That's ASAP. That's how he's feeling. Have you ever been in a place where you've been going through so much, and maybe that time is now, where you can't even do what you're called to do? You know you're supposed to be a parent. That's your number one calling. That's your number one ministry. But you have so many other things going on in your life. It's just like, ah, take the phone and get out of my hair. Have you been there? Or you've been at work and you just can't, you can't do what you know you need to do because there's so many other things going on. This is where Asaph is. And in this moment, he is very honest with God. That's the first thing. If you're taking notes, write that down. What do you do when God is not good enough? You be honest. And Asaph is honest with God. And can I tell you, this is really difficult for me to do because Scripture says that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of all wisdom. And I was taught we respect the Lord, we show him reverence. How? Asaph is saying, take your unholy thoughts, your angry thoughts, your honest thoughts, and tell them to a holy God. I don't know about you, but that sounds counterintuitive, and that's not easy to do. But here's the thing about God. He already knows. He already knows what we're feeling. And so Asaph, he says, go to God. And Asaph wrote part of the Bible. This has been preserved for thousands of years. And he's saying, when you're having trouble discovering the wonder, be honest with the God who brings wonder. And then he goes on to say this in verse 6. I remembered my song in the night. My heart meditated and my spirit asked, will the Lord reject forever? Will he never show his favor again? Has he in his unfailing love, has his unfailing love vanished forever? Has his promises failed for all time? Verse 9, has God forgotten to be merciful? Has he in his anger withheld his compassion Second thing, what do you do when God's not good enough? You ask why. And we see this guy asking God why. Again, this is counterintuitive. Because I've always been told you don't question God. You don't question God's plans. His plan's perfect. Who are you to question God? Just let go and let God. It'll all work out in the end, but what if it doesn't? Asaph questions God. Don't you think it would make sense to ask questions to the one who is all-knowing? To the one who set it all in motion? To the one who knows you and has a plan for your life? Wouldn't it, wouldn't it make sense to go to him? If we're asking questions from anybody, a lot of times we get advice from our friends. And our friends, they don't give us the greatest advice sometimes. Who better to go to than to God For help, he asks why, and he seeks to understand. The more questions we ask, oftentimes the more we understand. And in verse 10, we're about to see a shift take place in this man because up until this point, he's really not in a good headspace. Everything that's going on, his circumstances, they've, they've really got him messed up. And so verse 10, it shifts. A change happens. He says, then I thought to this I will appeal the years when the Most High stretched out his right hand. He says, I will remember. Y'all say that with me at all of our campuses. I will remember. One more time. I will remember. He says, I will remember the deeds of the Lord. Yes, I will remember your miracles of long ago. The third thing we do when we don't think God is good enough, we remember. Because as we remember, we begin to zone out and see a bigger picture of what God is doing. See, Asaph, just a couple verses ago, he is remembering how God has been faithful to him, but now he's saying, I got to think past myself. I got to get off myself. I need to see how God has been faithful for generations. And in verse 15, he says, With your mighty arm, you redeemed your people, the descendants of Joseph and Jacob. Verse 19, he says, Your path led through the sea. Where did his path lead? 
through. His path led where? Through the sea. Your way led through the mighty waters. Though your footprints were not seen, you led your people like a flock by the hand of Moses and Aaron. What's he doing? He's remembering. And he remembers the story of Joseph. You see, Joseph was a guy who was given a gift before he was mature enough to handle this gift. And he tells his brothers how one day he is going to rule over them. And his brothers didn't like that. So they threw him in a pit. And while he was in the pit, he was sold to a caravan of Ishmaelites who took him all the way to Egypt and sold him into slavery. And then from there, he got sold again. And then from there, he went to prison. And then he sat in prison for years and years and years and years and years until the king had a dream and the king needed somebody to interpret that dream. And who better to interpret the dream than the person who is in the prison in the king's castle? Joseph. And Asaph is remembering this. And he's saying, okay, if you did it for Joseph, you can do it for me. And he's saying, all right, I see it. Joseph, Joseph had to go through it. You didn't let Joseph go around it. You ensure Joseph went right through the middle because when he went through it, that's when God gave him exactly what he needed to get through it. And because of what he went through, that, he, that set him up to provide a miracle for his entire nation. It's wild to think that God does not lead us around our problems. God does not lead us around our failures. He does not lead us around 2020. We don't go from no virus to vaccine without going through 2020. For whatever reason, he leads his people through. And as he leads us through, it is so important that we know who to go to. Where do we go? The only place we know where to go, our refuge, our strength, our ever-present help in times of trouble. The Lord is my strength. The Lord is my refuge. So no matter what I go through, I can know that God will eventually get me through. He's not going to get me around. He's not going to get you around. He's going to get you through. And as we go through, let's remember to be honest. Let's seek to understand and ask why. And let's remember the faithfulness of our God. And as we remember his faithfulness, I know and trust that the wonder switch will be flipped and we'll begin to see the wonder of our refuge. Father in heaven, we love you, Lord. We thank you that no matter what we go through, you are constant. You are our ever-present help in times of trouble. God, you lead us. And for whatever reason, you don't lead us around, but Father, you lead us through. And so as you lead us through, I pray that you will give us perspective to see that you are moving and you're active and you've never let us go and you will continue to take us where we need to be. We love you, Lord, and we praise you. And it's in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen.